Okay, well, here we go in, uh, in Hebrews, Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12. The law made nothing perfect, but bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So the better hope being the having the law written in their hearts and in their minds. So that's Hebrews 7.19. We're well beyond that now. We're in Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to try to see if we can if we can cover all of Hebrews chapter 12 today. Um, now, the, the, the introduction is still the same. It is this epistle is addressed to circumcised Hebrew kingdom gospel believers, where we read in Hebrews 10, 39, but we, which would be the Hebrews, we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So we've, we've, we've looked at this verse, and we've talked about this epistle being addressed to the Hebrews, but I thought what I'd start with a few questions. So the first question being, what and who is a Hebrew? What and who is a Hebrew? Anybody want to answer? Okay, so Genesis 14, 13. Abraham, or Abram, that's what his name was. Abram was the first Hebrew. Abram the Hebrew. Hebrew is an ethnicity. So those that descend from Abram are Hebrews. So Abram, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they are Hebrew people. Next question, what and who is a Jew? My response, Galatians 1.13, the Jews, it's a religion, the Jews' religion. Paul religiously identified as a Jew, and he was initially, he was of the sect of the Pharisees. So today, Hebrews will call themselves Jew. What they're doing is they're referring to themselves by their religion. But really, ethnically, the Hebrew is a Hebrew. There are Hebrews, which are, no. well, they identify as Christians. There are Hebrews that may identify as agnostics. There are Hebrews that may identify as atheists, but the primary religion of the Hebrew is Jew or Judaism. And so we see that in Philippians 3, 5 and Acts 26, 5. Now, question, was Abram a Jew? Was Abram, Abraham, was he a Jew? I'll say no. No. Abram was, Abraham was not a Jew. The Jews are first mentioned uh, as those Hebrews living in Judah in 2 Kings 16.6. So uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh, they did not identify as Jews. They identified as Hebrews. So then, next question would be, what and who is Israel? My response, Israel is the nation of the Hebrew people. Genesis 32:28. And then, so here we have, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. So Jacob was the one who had his name changed to Israel, the son of Isaac, and who was the brother to Esau. So Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob uh, usurped the blessing from Esau. It was Jacob then who had his name changed by God to Israel. 
2 Samuel 7, 23a. And what one nation in earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself. So we've covered now the Hebrew is an ethnicity. The Jew is a religion of the Hebrews. Uh, Abraham was not a Jew. And we've now also reviewed that Israel refers to the people, the nation. Okay, a little bit more before we get into Hebrews 12, because we're talking about Hebrews, so we might as well know who they are. So why wasn't the epistle to the Hebrews addressed to and as the epistle to the Jews? Ever think about that? So why is it addressed to the Hebrews? Why not to the Jews? My response, the Hebrews would be the largest Hebrew audience. If it had been addressed to the Jews, then that would have been a smaller audience of the, all the Hebrews for whom God considers to be his people. So God doesn't declare that the Jew is my people. He says the, the Hebrews are his people. It's those people that are of Israel, of the nation Israel. They are to be his people. Next question. Do the Jews all believe the same teachings? Now, I'm referring to the religion. Do the, do the religious Hebrews, who are Jews, do they all believe the same teachings? My response, no, there are different sects of Jew, Jews. Each of them have their own doctrines. So there are doctrines of Jews which are very conservative. There are doctrines of Jews which are very liberal and everything which is in between. So why wasn't then the epistle to the Hebrews addressed to and as the epistle to the Christians? You say, well, what is, what is a Christian? So actually the the OED, uh, the Oxford English De Dictionary, def defines Christian as one who follows the religion of Jesus. I'm not sure if you knew that. I'm not sure if I knew that. So Christian, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, are those who follow the religion of Jesus. Now, why wasn't it addressed to the Christians? Because same, really the same response. It's the Hebrew people, which are the, and referring to the Hebrews, uh, ensures that the, that the letter, this epistle, is, it reaches the largest Hebrew audience. Okay, so those are some introductory questions to try to help level set on why we're dealing with a letter to the Hebrews. It is to the Hebrews that God has uh, called a people for his name to serve him. Now, we move into Hebrews chapter 12. We've got this chapter and chapter 13 to go. We're almost through the entire epistle. And this chapter, we did start it last time. And this one is going to have to do with enduring. So the Hebrews are being called to endure, and their example is Jesus. Uh, Jesus endured the cross. You know, it's, it's interesting. There are Christians today who consider Jesus their example. Actually, he is an example to the Hebrews. And I, and I suspect that when we get through this chapter, if you've had thoughts that you want to be a saint, or that you are a saint, you may be glad to have reason to understand that uh, I'm not a saint because of what the Hebrews, who in fact are the ones that were separated to God, that they are called to endure. All right, so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2b, that is about 
enduring. All right, so uh, Vivian will, will read so that we can do a little catch up here to where we left off last time. Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse one. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so, so Jesus is put forward right here at the beginning of this chapter 12 as having endured the cross. So this, this word endured, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna show up here in chapter 12 a few times because this is the message to the Hebrews. Now, as a result of enduring the cross, he has sat down at the, at the right hand of the throne of God. And that comes from Psalm 110 verse one. Psalm 110 verse one. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay, so it's, so the writer to the Hebrews presumes that the reader knows this scripture, knows all these scriptures. That's why it makes sense that it's written to Hebrews. All right, now we move on to verses three through six. Hebrews 12, three. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as, uh, as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son, whom he receiveth. Okay, so th these are words that are often, you know, picked up by believers today and, and think that this is part of their lot as being a believer. But really, as, when we see this and we look at it now in detail, uh, this has to do with instruction to the Hebrews as being God's people. For consider him that endured, again, there's that word, endured such contradiction of sinners contradiction of sinners that is there were those and and the writer calls them sinners they contradicted jesus and he endured that contradiction against himself and he in the encouragement now to these hebrews is um to avoid being wearied or faint in your mind so expect contradiction of those who do not believe and avoid being weary, you know, we say tired, but worn out and faint in your minds from hearing this constant contradiction. This is pointing to the time that uh, the Hebrew is going to be experiencing the time of Jacob's trouble. They are going to be going through much contradiction of sinners and they are going to be worn very thin. So this is an encouragement that they endure as Christ did, and also in the manner that Christ did. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Now notice this, ye have not yet resisted unto blood. That is, they have not yet resisted to the shedding of their own blood and death, as Jesus did. So the writer is pointing out, <clears throat> the time may come where you will have to die in being God's people, not yet resisted. Now, Peter to the kingdom saints, this is what Peter says to them. First Peter chapter two, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. So Christ suffered for us, that is the Hebrews, leaving us an example. 
So Christ's suffering is actually the example to, it is the, the example to the Hebrews and that they are to follow in his steps. That's uh, that those steps of suffering. Ye have not resisted unto blood. Now, interesting, the new uh, Living Translation Bible uh, doesn't like the word blood. So it deletes the word blood. And instead, it renders Hebrews 12.4, the New Living Translation, after all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. So they've done a little bit of cleaning up because, you know, blood's a little bit messy. So let's avoid that word. Okay, back to what Peter now is admonishing to, uh, to the believers, to the believing Hebrews. First Peter, we're picking up again in chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. And it's about Jesus, who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Okay, so these words really do properly belong to the Hebrew. It's Paul now speaking to those kingdom saints, those who are expecting the kingdom, but yet are going to have to go through a time of purging and suffering. And so they're being encouraged by Peter as to how Jesus, uh, how he endured those things, even when there was, there was no guile found in his mouth. That is, he, was, he wasn't a liar. Everything that he said, Jesus said, was true. But... He was, when he was um, condemned, he didn't condemn back. He kept his mouth quiet. He suffered. He didn't threaten them. And he just willingly bear their sins in his own body. And then there's here, notice at the, at the end of the, at this passage, verse 25, for ye were as sheep going astray but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Can I just... So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh no, it's okay. Yeah. No. All right. So, so Jesus, so the point here in this passage, these words that Peter has written is Jesus is their example. Now let's compare uh, what Paul had to say to the call to be saints. Now, the call to be saints are also Hebrews. They're uncircumcised, but they are called into saint, sainthood service by Paul. And so as Hebrews, the words that Paul has to these saints is very parallel to what the saints of the kingdom uh, were also to ex are, are also to expect. So Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, though thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So it's it's you know it's very easy to just sort of read this, and it's just so many words. But if I just slow down a moment and take a look, what we're saying is we see here that Paul says to these Hebrew called to be saints, "Let this mind be in you." What is the mind that Paul is pointing to? Obedience unto death. So Paul is saying to these called to be saints, these Hebrews, that they're to have the same mind as Jesus had, which is being obedient, even if it means their death. 
So the Hebrew called to be saints are to have the same mind of Christ. And then we read, and ye have forgotten. So this is back in Hebrews 12 now. Uh, <clears throat> we're looking at verses 5 and 6. Notice the, the writer starts by saying, ye have forgotten. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So uh, this is something that, that has slipped their mind. And so he's now, the writer is reminding them of the chastening of the Lord. This is not to me a partaker of the benefit. Since I am not one capable of serving God, I don't have the qualifications, the ability, the knowledge. I have none of the gifts. I'm not a member in particular. I cannot perform. But they were to perform and expect chastening. So the Hebrew kingdom saints are reminded. And these are words from scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And again, it's said in Psalms. Psalm 6 verse 1, Psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thine, thy hot displeasure. The number of times that these words about chastening uh, come up, it, it's hard. You know, we'd say it's hard for the Hebrew to forget this, but they did forget it. And here we see the chasing here in Psalm 6, 1, the, the petition of David is to not be chastened when God is hot mad. <laughs> Don't chasten me when you're hot in thy hot displeasure. And then in Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord. And teachest him out of thy law. And then Psalm 118. 118 verse 18. The Lord hath chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. And then finally. Proverbs 3 verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. Okay, so the point being, all these scriptures belong to the Hebrews. This is their education. This is for them to be aware of. That's why the writer to the Hebrew says, you know, don't forget these things because chastening will happen. Now, chastening comes for a purpose. Now, let's compare what Paul said to the call to be saints. First Corinthians, Vivian. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Okay, so I know there are plenty of right dividers. And, and well, let's face it, really all of Christian teaching is that we are saints. And that, well, you know, here's this letter, Paul writing it to the body of Christ. Um, but he's writing it to a specific audience. He's writing it to the call to be saints. And he's saying that to expect to be chastened by the Lord. This is not for me to be expect to be chastened by the Lord because I'm a partaker of the benefit. First Timothy 6, 2. So why am I in a special class? Well, I'm not capable of serving God. I don't have the knowledge of the scriptures that the Hebrew was brought up with. I have none of the qualifications. And just labeling me as a Christian because I believed in the death, burial, and resurrection doesn't somehow make me capable of doing anything. I am, my status has been changed from lost to save, but I am still waiting to be changed as a person when we come face to face with Jesus at that time. In the meantime, I'm no more than I was before I became a believer.
Okay, now let's continue in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the, Lord, whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So you can see the, 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 the message in this chapter is, is, a, is a tough message. It's all about enduring. It's about chastening. It's about expecting the worst while on this earth. And it's, it's a message to the Hebrews. So he says, if ye endure chastening. So again, that word endure. Then the, the encouragement is that God is dealing with you as a son. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And then we have, we have these other verses, which we've already seen, but we'll just look at it again. Hebrews 12, verse 3. For consider him, that is Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So it is the kingdom believing Hebrew that is to endure chastening. Now, it's replacement theology that substitutes the Christian to be in need of chastening. And this is a this is a very unfortunate imposition that you know the, that Christian theology has has uh, layered on top of being a believer today that the Christian is to is in need of chastening, and so when bad things happen to me, then I am to suspect that I've done something to offend God, and now God is chastening me. I may have, there may be some loss of blessing, there may be some unfortunate turns in life, maybe a flat tire, maybe a loss of a job, uh, sickness, uh, financial reversals, all of these tend to fall into the category today of a Christian being in need of chastening. And there are probably no end of, of ministers who will point to somebody having um, say, an unfortunate turn in life, maybe financial reversal, as being, oh, the chastening of the Lord. So you need to find out what sin you've done and, and repent of it so that you can get out of this chastening of the Lord. Very sad. It's very sad. It's a, it's a terrible thing that, uh, that believers today are, are having to deal with. Now, we continue on with verse 8 of chapter 12, but if, notice the condition, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. So notice this, the way the words are here in this verse 8, it's if you're without chastisement, and in, the writer very quickly as whereof all are partakers. So all the Hebrews are to expect chastisement, not just those that are um, somehow not living the right way. The writer says, all are partakers. Then what the writer uh, says is, well, you, be concerned. And he says, he says if, you're, if you're not experiencing chastisement, he says, then you're a, you're a bastard, not a son. So a bastard is one born out of wedlock or an illegitimate child, one that does not belong to God. So God only chastises those who belong to him of the Hebrews. So bastards, that word there in verse 8, are those that are not dealt with as sons of God. And they, again, I underscore Hebrew sons of God. This, this epistle is written to Hebrews. It's not written to Christians. It's not written to Jews. It's written to Hebrews, a very large group of people. 
It's not written to the body of Christ. Not written to the body of Christ. Certainly not written to partakers of the benefit. What we're doing here is we're, we're taking a look at the instruction to the Hebrews. Then the writer says in verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? And then we have Proverbs 13.24. Proverbs 13.24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chastiseth him betimes. I know. Unfortunately, my father, just before I got a spanking, he would re, he would he would always remind me of Proverbs thirteen twenty four, that uh, unfortunately he needed to spank me because he loved me. But <laughs> anyhow, we move on from that. Now we're looking at Hebrews chapter twelve verses ten to eleven. Hebrews twelve, starting at verse ten. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Okay, again, a lot of words. Let's take a look. For they... Verily, for a few days, chastened us. Now, speaking of earthly fathers, they chastened us after their own pleasure. Not that they took pleasure, but they out of their own reasons. For he, for our profit, so this chastening is for their profit, that we, Hebrews, that we might be partakers of his holiness. So I note that partakers of his holiness does not equal partakers of the benefit, 1 Timothy 6, 2. So partakers of his holiness is a category of those Hebrews who experience the chastisement of the Lord. They are, they are separated unto serving him. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So a word of encouragement here by the writer that now, even though the chastisement is, is no fun, there is a peace and a joy which is going to come afterwards now chapter 12 we'll look at verses 12 to 13 hebrews 12 starting at verse 12 wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed okay so verse 12 tw hebrews now chapter 12 verse 12 Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. So this is not an instruction about how we should worship. No, this is uh, Isaiah 35, 3. Isaiah th 35, 3. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. This is another warning to the Hebrews that they are to avoid sin. They are to strengthen their hands from temptation. They are to confirm their feeble knees from going the wrong way. And in verse 13, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. So notice this now. So you, we talked about first the hands and then the knees. And then these words make straight paths for your feet. And, it's, and the, the, the purpose here is to avoid being, being turned out of the way. Now, Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Okay, so the Hebrew is to be mindful of these things. 
They're to stay on the right path, not to take the path that seems right to them, but the path that is of their scriptures, because the path that might seem right to them is the ways, the ways are the ways of death. The end of the ways that they might want to go would just lead to death. Now we'll look at chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Okay, so let's look here. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So this peace with all men, this is something now the Hebrew is instructed to have peace with all one, all men. Now, we're going to look at a little bit of background here on this matter of peace. And we're going to start first in Ezekiel chapter 7. And, and we'll, we'll see now what the prophets have to say to Israel with respect to this matter of seeking peace with all men. Ezekiel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Also, thou son of man, thus saith the Lord God unto the land of Israel, an end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon thee. And I will send mine anger upon thee, and will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. Okay, so let's not miss what's being said here. This, these are pretty severe words, and it's being, it's being pronounced on the land of Israel, and it has to do with their ways. He says, notice this, they're going to be judged according to thy ways and recompense upon thee all thine abominations. So the way they're living in the land and their ways are going to be recompensed, or that is they'll be compensated according to their abominations. Now we'll continue in Ezekiel 7, verses 4, 6, and 25. Ezekiel 7, starting at verse 4. And mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abominations shall be in the midst of thee, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, an evil, and only evil, behold, is come, an end is come, the end is come, it watcheth for thee, behold, it is come. And verse 25, destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. Okay, so <clears throat> we were reading here in Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men. And here we see in what Ezekiel is saying that they're going to seek peace, but they'll find none. They'll seek peace and there'll be none. Now, Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, verse 22. There is no peace saith the Lord unto the wicked. So it has to do with the way they're conducting themselves. If they're not conducting themselves in the way of holiness, uh, living according to God's uh, judgments and statutes, there is no peace. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 14, verse 19. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Hath thou hath thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us, and there is no healing for us? We looked for peace, and there is no good, 
and for the time of healing and behold trouble okay so this is doing to having to do with the re, they're being rejected they're being smitten they're they're not they're, they're not being made whole there's no healing they're looking for peace there is no peace they're finding nothing but trouble the the issue is how they're living because we read just prior to this they're being recompensed according to their ways ezekiel ezekiel 13 verse 16 to wit the prophets of israel which prophesy concerning jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her and there is no peace saith the lord god so all of this is for me uh, it underscores the importance that God's people, the one whom he had chosen, is under obligation to live according to his statutes, according to his judgments, and to live according to his ways, not according to their ways. When they go their ways, they run into trouble. There is no peace. They're looking for peace but there is no peace because the prophets have told them you're not living the way god wants you to live now this is not my decision this is god's decision it has nothing to do with me um they they are god's elect they are the apple of god's eye i lament for them i would desire that they live according to god's ways so that they could have peace, but it's their decision how they're going to live. Now in Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 14. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Notice the admonition, depart from evil, do good. This is instruction not to Christians, it's instruction to Hebrews. Hebrews are God's elect. Psalm 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. So I am I'm one that wants the best for all the Hebrews. I want the best for Israel. When Israel in its proper place, the world will benefit. So the peace of Jerusalem is something that we should look for um, because prospering will follow. But until then, as the, as the Hebrew goes, so goes the rest of the world. Now, Paul, to the saints and to the call to be saints. So Paul is actually here in this reference in Romans. He's speaking both to saints of the kingdom, of the kingdom and called to be saints of the body of Christ. In the dispensation of grace. During the dispensation of grace. This is, these are the words that Paul has to say. Paul's a Hebrew. Romans 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Okay, so individually, Paul is calling them, all of them, saints, the kingdom saints, as well as saints of the body of Christ, as much as it is possible. He says, live peaceably with all men. So he's not calling for peace in Jerusalem, but on an individual basis, he's encouraging them, do what you can to live peaceably with all men. All right, then now let's look at Hebrews 12, 15a. We're going to look at uh, this, this, uh, these words in detail here looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. So this is the first lest. There's going to be a number of lests. There's a first lest. The word lest itself is defined as something to prevent or something to avoid. So this first lest is to avoid failing of the grace of God. Romans chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, that is the Hebrews. Not, only, not to that only which is of the law, 
but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So this is something that Paul now says to all Hebrews, both of the kingdom and of the body, he says, of faith, that it might be by grace to the Hebrews. This is the first lesson. Avoid failing the grace of God. Romans 3.30. Romans 3.30, the first part of the verse. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith. Okay, by faith. All right. Now, another lest. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So there is bitterness that can crop up in the heart of the Hebrew. I mean, all of us are subject to these things, but this is instruction to them, and they are to avoid this matter of bitterness with respect to who they are. Now, the second less. Now, the context here of the verse that uh, Vivian is going to read has to do with Peter and John when they were in Samaria, and they were dispensing the gift of the Holy, Holy Ghost, by the laying on of hands. And then this was something that a man, Simon, wanted to buy. So Peter and John then address Simon, who wants to buy this gift of the Holy Ghost. And notice the words how Peter and John respond to Simon. So that he could lay hands on others. He wanted to do the same thing. He go, give me this power. Acts 8, verse 23, for I, that's Peter, perceive that thou, this is the certain man, a Jew called Simon, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Okay, so noticing here that Simon, who's a Jew, and saw what Peter and John were doing and wanted, wanted to make a deal with them that they could, that they would sell him the gift of the Holy Ghost because he wanted to be able to do the things and thereby get notoriety as well of the laying on of hands. And so in response, Simon ended up in the gall of bitterness and then notice this, in the bond of iniquity because of his attitude, instead of believing and following Peter and John, he wanted to do a deal with them. Now we'll look at the third lest, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So this is the third lest, this is the third item to be avoided. First Corinthians chapter five, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Okay, so this is instruction to the Hebrew amongst Hebrews. This is not instruction to me as, say, a believer, that if I think that a certain other believer is covetous, that I should not uh, have anything to do with them, uh, or a drunkard or an extortioner. Uh, this is that would be instruction of shunning. It's not given to believers uh, who are partakers of the benefit, because the truth be known, uh, all of us suffer from these sins. And just because somebody has a clean white shirt on doesn't mean that they are somehow better than the next person. We're all at the same level. So there's, there's no sense in being able to uh, avoid fellowship with others because, you, because I might think that they are not as good as I am. Not at all. We're all the same, and we're not to find excuse to not be with one another. Although I, I heard a message this week on the radio where the, the, the minister was saying there are certain people you shouldn't have company with because they're, they're sinful people. Well... <clears throat> I don't know. Now, this is about Esau. So, a fornicator or profane person as Esau, 
who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So this is about Esau is the example. He's not an example to me. He, Esau is an example to other Hebrews. So here's the example. Esau sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So Esau anxiously, with tears, wanted the blessing, but there was no place for him to change his mind. In other words, he had made a deal. He had uh, rejected uh, his blessing by making a deal, and there was no going back. The deal was closed. And so he was rejected. There was no, no place for him to change his mind because that which was done was done. He cried. He was tearful about it. But those tears wouldn't change the fact that a deal had been made and it was done. There was no going back. So the Hebrew is warned. Don't do the sort of thing that Esau did. Esau found no place of repentance. Uh, so to the Hebrews, God will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations. So this is not the gospel of grace to the Hebrews. This is how they are to live. And they're being constantly warned and reminded that to live a certain way so that they find blessings from God and not judgments. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5, 5a, and verse 6. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments. And verse 6. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So replacement theology would have me think that because Israel, the Hebrews, didn't do as God had instructed them to do, that God gave up with them and God replaced them with the Christian today. So now the Christian is to get the blessings of these things and that the Hebrew now is to get the punishments. Well, that's, that's a very terrible teaching because what that's saying is effectively that since God failed with the Hebrews, he wasn't able to perform. And so he had to go find another people to do it with. And, and God doesn't change his mind. He has taught the Hebrew statutes and judgments, his expectation is that they will therefore keep them and do them. And they will at some point in their existence, and they will exist for a very, very long time, they will perform exactly. And when they are performing as God has intended them to perform, the nations will benefit. So notice what, what, the, what Moses writes here, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 6, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. The nations will see how Israel lives, and their response is going to be, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great and uh, nation is a wise and understanding people. So that's the benefit of Israel living the way God has intended them to live. Okay, we'll move now to chapter 12, verses 18 to 21. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. 
and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. All right, verses, uh, chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. Now, you know, I wasn't there, but the Hebrews were there. And so this is their history. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. These are all the things that were happening on the mount when Moses was going to get the, uh, the law from God. He says, and the sound of a trumpet, the voice of the words, which voice they, that would be the people, they, the people, when they heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. So this is, this, these were the, the Hebrew people in the wilderness. When they saw all these things happening, they had, they didn't want any more of God speaking to them. So all reasons which they entreated Moses, they wanted Moses to deal with God. On the, their behalf. On, on behalf. So he wanted them. So he said, you entreat. The people did not want God to speak directly to them. They said, look, Moses, uh, let God speak to you, and you come and tell us what, what God has said. So why did the people entreat that the word should not be spoken to them anymore? Well, the answer is now in chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. Here's the reason. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So this was the severity of those dealings at the mount they could not endure. In fact, if a beast touched the, touched the mount that, that Moses had ascended, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, that beast had to be put to death. That was how terrible the sight was. It was even, it was frightening to Moses as well. Okay, now we'll move on verses 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Okay, so now coming into view now is the new covenant. The new covenant um, uh, now in our minds should be um, recognized as the law written in their hearts and in their mind. But ye are not come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Notice this, just men are going to be made perfect. So these, not just a man, but just men. So these, are, these men are just, but they're not yet made perfect. So how are the spirits of just men made perfect? So the circumcised Hebrew kingdom gospel believer were those that were identified as just men. That is, they were just in their uh, ways. So they were just men, but they were not yet perfect. Where does perfection come in? Let's look at verse 24, Hebrews 12, 24. This now will point to perfection. The spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh 
better things than that of Abel even. So Abel believed God and he provided a sacrifice which was more excellent than his brother Cain. But this new covenant is even more excellent than what Abel did. So the new covenant, and the reason being that Abel performed this in his flesh, what's going to happen with the new covenant is they will be changed on the inside. That's the better things. Hebrews 10, A. Hebrews 10, uh, verse eight. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10a. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Okay. So these are the better things. The covenant in their mind and written in their hearts. This is what the Hebrew is to look forward to. This is not something that's being said to me. I'm not going to have the law of God written in my mind. I'm not going to have the law of God written in my heart. I have not lived under law, and I am not yet to live. I'm not destined to live under law. I live under grace. By the grace of God, I'm saved, uh, and not by law. Okay. Now, chapter 12, Hebrews 12, looking at verses 25 to 27. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped, if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away, away from him that speaketh from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Okay, so see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Okay, now this is this is uh, instruction to these Hebrews that if they escape not uh, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn from him that speaketh from heaven. If they escaped who not. if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth. So they're, re they're getting instruction from the writer to the Hebrews, and he's saying, you know, uh, don't refuse these instructions. As some did in the wilderness. They did. Yeah. And died. And they, they weren't able to escape. So him that spake on the earth. So who's him that spake on the earth? Notice Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, that is the Jews. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So here we have a representative, Paul, of the body of Christ and Barnabas, who is of the kingdom saints, and they wax bold. So they are, are saying things with great assertion to these Jewish Hebrews. And they say to them, it was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken to you, to those Jews. But they weren't accepting of it. So, but seeing that you put it from you, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So these Gentiles starting with the uncircumcised Hebrews. So now this isn't a pronouncement that all the Jews now are not going to be. This is a particular group, and this particular group refused it. And so now they're going to turn, turn to the Gentiles. All the ones, all these Jews had opportunity to hear this truth. And they had opportunity to decide whether they would receive it or refuse it. 
So him that speaketh from heaven. So God is speaking through human instruments. So those that spake on the earth were being, were speaking by the authority of God. Whose voice then shook the earth. Not also the earth, but also heaven. Now look at Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill the his, this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, so the Hebrew knows from their prophets that God intends to shake things up a bit. But there are things that can be shaken, and there are things that cannot be shaken. And, and this word, yet once more, signified the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain so there's a little bit of a shake-up going on here and there are things that are going to be removed and there are things that are going to remain so let's look at luke 6 48 luke chapter 6 verse 48 he is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood arose the, st the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock okay so here's here's an example to the hebrews luke 648 of things that cannot be shaken for the reason it's founded upon the rock and then in matthew matthew 24 verse 29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Okay, so there's, there's shaking that's going to happen in the heavens as well. Okay, yet once more, and this word... This is now Hebrews 12, 26, and this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So there's going to be a reordering, a re an adjustment of things. Haggai 2, 9. Haggai 2, 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the, of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, so now we have the, the prophet Haggai uh, telling the people of, of Israel, the Hebrews, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. So the last one will be greater than the first one. And then the last one will be in this place will I give peace? Because that will be the time when in, that, in, the, in, the, in the final house, when Israel has been put in order and are living according to uh, God's order. All right. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Okay, so we receiving, we, that's we Hebrews, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. So that's the kingdom that cannot, that they're going to receive, it cannot be moved. The glory of this latter house, that's the latter house, shall be greater than the former. This is God's pronouncement. And here in Hebrews, they're being reminded of this. And in this place, I will give peace, saith the, the Lord of hosts. So they're going to serve. In 12, Hebrews 12, 28, whereby we may serve God. They serve God, then they have peace. They serve God acceptably. So we Hebrews, serving God in the kingdom. Exodus 7 
Chapter 7, verses 14 and 16. Exodus 7, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. In verse 16. And thou, Moses, shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Okay, so I, I, I share with you Exodus 7, verses 14 and 16, because we've just read here in, in Hebrews 12, 28, whereby we may serve God acceptably. Who is to serve God? Well, according to God, the Lord God of the Hebrews calls the Hebrews his people, that his people are the ones that are to serve him. There's no replacing these Hebrews who are to serve God with another people. And that we may serve God acceptably with reverence. So what's reverence? That's deep, due respect towards a person on account of his position or relationship. That's reverence, deep respect. And with fear, godly fear. So fear is a mingled feeling of dread and reverence towards God. That's, that's what they are to have, both reverence and fear. And then the, the, uh, the sentence ends with a colon. Now, the colon explains the prior, th that says that the words that follow will now explain this prior thought. So the prior thought is serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now, here's the explanation. For our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24. Deuteronomy 4.24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Instruction to the Hebrews. Deuteronomy 9, verse 3. Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. And he shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Okay, again, so this is instruction to these Hebrews about how they are to serve God with reverence and fear, because God, their God, is a consuming fire. Now, as a partaker of the benefit, our relationship with God is by faith, is uh, Faith through, uh, by, faith. by faith through grace. And or actually, by grace through, through faith. faith. Oh, sorry, how did sorry. we mess that up? <laughs> uh, we messed that up, good. So the relationship with us is one that is of grace, whereas the Hebrew is one that is to perform, and they need to perform so that the rest of the world can come into order. And that takes us then to the end of chapter 12. Next time, we'll pick up on chapter 13. And in chapter 13, we'll see, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp. And without the camp, bearing his reproach. So in chapter 12, we were dealing with enduring. And now in chapter 13, the final words to the Hebrews will be about bearing his reproach. And that was without the camp that is outside the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so we'll end it there.